everyone and welcome to Soft Stories. I'm Stratton and today we are going to be continuing our reading of Emma by Jane Austen. Before we begin, I just wanted to make another announcement of my plans to release a special and different episode, hopefully before the end of the year, a question and answer session in the style of First We Feast's Hot Ones series. I think that it will be great fun. I enjoy hot sauce, but obviously I have never had the opportunity to experience anything quite like what will be on offer. But for a question and answer session to work, I need questions to answer. I feel very privileged that some of you have taken the time to comment on some of my videos, and I would be honoured if you would do so to give me a couple of questions about anything at all, how I choose the books I read, who I am and my background, why there is suddenly a dog sitting in the background of the videos. Any questions you might have on any subject, I would be delighted to answer, with the obvious caveats that the purpose of this series is to be entertaining and calming for people of all ages and experiences. So I reserve the right to editorialize just a little bit. At any rate, with that out of the way and with my hearty thanks, Pepper and I invite you to join us for chapter 38 of Emma by Jane Austen. No misfortune occurred again to prevent the ball. The day approached, the day arrived, and after a morning of some anxious watching, Frank Churchill in all the certainty of his own self, reached Randall's before dinner, and everything was safe. No second meeting had there yet been between him and Emma. The room at the Crown was to witness it, but it would be better than a common meeting in a crowd. Mr. Weston, had been so very earnest in his entreaties for her early attendance, for her arriving there as soon as possible after themselves, for the purpose of taking her opinion as to the propriety and comfort of the rooms before any other persons came, that she could not refuse him, and must, therefore, spend some quiet interval in the young man's company. She was to convey Harriet, and they drove to the Crown in good time, the Randalls' party just sufficiently before them. Frank Churchill seemed to have been on the watch, and though he did not say much, his eyes declared that he meant to have a delightful evening. They all walked about 
together. To see that everything was as it should be. And within a few minutes were joined by the contents of another carriage, which Emma could not hear the sound of at first without great surprise. So unreasonably early, she was going to exclaim. But she presently found that it was a family of old friends, who were coming, like herself, by a particular desire to help Mr. Weston's judgment. And they were so very closely followed by another carriage of cousins, who had been entreated to come early with the same distinguishing earnestness, on the same errand, that it seemed as if half the company might soon be collected together for the purpose of preparatory inspection. Emma perceived that her taste was not the only taste on which Mr. Weston depended, and felt that to be the favourite and intimate of a man who had so many intimates and confidants was not the very first distinction in the scale of vanity. She liked his open manners, but a little less of open-heartedness would have made him a higher character. General benevolence, but not general friendship, made a man what he ought to be. She could fancy such a man. The whole party walked about, and looked, and praised again, and then, having nothing else to do, formed a sort of half-circle round the fire, to observe in their various moods, till the other subjects were started, that, though May, a fire in the evening was still quite pleasant. Emma found that it was not Mr. Weston's fault that the number of privy councillors was not yet larger. They had stopped at Mrs. Bates's door to offer the use of their carriage, but the aunt and niece were to be brought by the Eltons. Frank was standing by her, but not steadily. There was a restlessness which showed a mind not at ease, he was looking about, he was going to the door, he was watching for the sound of other carriages, impatient to begin, or afraid of being always near her. Mrs. Elton was spoken of. I think she must be here soon, said he. I have a great curiosity to see Mrs. Elton. I have heard so much of her. It cannot be long, I think, before she comes. A carriage was heard. He was on the move immediately, but coming back, said, I am forgetting that I am not acquainted with her. I have never seen either Mr. or Mrs. Elton. I have no business to put myself forward. Mr. and Mrs. Elton appeared, and all the smiles and proprieties Past. But Miss Bates and Miss Fairfax, said Mr. Weston, looking about, we thought you were to bring them. The mistake had been slight. The carriage was sent for them now. Emma longed to know what Frank's first opinion of Mrs. Elton might be, how he was affected by the studied elegance of her dress and her smiles of graciousness. He was immediately qualifying himself to form an opinion by giving her very proper attention after the introduction had passed. In a few minutes the carriage returned. Somebody talked of rain. I will see that there are umbrellas, sir, said Frank to his father. Miss Bates must not be forgotten. And away he went. Mr. Weston was following, but Mrs. Elton detained him to gratify him by her opinion of his son, and so briskly did she begin that the young man himself, though by no means moving slowly, could hardly be out of hearing. 
A very fine young man, indeed, Mr. Weston. You know I candidly told you I should form my own opinion, and I am happy to say that I am extremely pleased with him. You may believe me. I never compliment. I think him a very handsome young man, and his manners are precisely what I like and approve. So truly the gentleman, without the least conceit or puppyism. You must know that I have a vast dislike to puppies, quite a horror of them. Cover your ears, Pepper. They were never tolerated at Maple Grove. Neither Mr. Suckling nor me had ever any patience with them, and we used sometimes to say very cutting things. Selina, who was mild almost to a fault, bore with them much better. While she talked of his son, Mr. Weston's attention was chained, but when she got to Maple Grove, he could recollect that there were ladies just arriving to be attended to, and with happy smiles must hurry away. Mrs. Elton turned to Mrs. Weston. I have no doubt of its being our carriage with Miss Bates and Jane. Our coachman and horses are so extremely expeditious. I believe we drive faster than anybody. What a pleasure it is to send one's carriage for a friend. I understand that you were so kind as to offer, but another time. It would be quite unnecessary. You may be very sure I shall always take care of them. Miss Bates and Miss Fairfax, escorted by the two gentlemen, walked into the room, and Mrs. Elton seemed to think it as much her duty as Mrs. Weston's to receive them. Her gestures and movements might be understood by anyone who looked on like Emma, but her words, everybody's words, were soon lost under the incessant flow of Miss Bates, who came in talking, and had not finished her speech under many minutes after her being admitted into the circle at the fire. As the door opened, she was heard, So very obliging of you, no rain at all, nothing to signify. I do not care for myself, quite thick shoes, and Jane declares, well, as soon as she was within the door, well, this is brilliant indeed, this is admirable, excellently contrived, upon my word, nothing wanting, could not have imagined it, so well lighted up, Jane, Jane, look, do you ever see anything? Oh, Mr. Weston, you must really have had Aladdin's lamp. Good Mrs. Stokes would not know her own room again. I saw her as I came in. She was standing in the entrance. Oh, Mrs. Stokes, said I, but I had not time more. She was now met by Mrs. Weston. Very well, I thank you, ma'am. I hope you are quite well. Very happy to hear it. So afraid you might have a headache, seeing you pass by so often and knowing how much trouble you must have. Delighted to hear it indeed. Oh! Oh, dear Mrs. Elton, so obliging to you for the carriage. Oh, excellent time. Jane and I quite ready. Did not keep the horses a moment. Most comfortable carriage. Oh, and I am sure our thanks are due to you, Mrs. Weston, on that score. Mrs. Elton has most kindly sent Jane a note, or we should have been. But two such offers in one day never were such neighbours. I said to my mother, upon my word, ma'am. Oh, thank you. My mother is remarkably well. Gone to Mr. Woodhouse's. I made her take her shawl, for the evenings are not warm. Her large new shawl, Mrs. Dixon's wedding present. So kind of her to think of my mother. Bought at Weymouth, you know, Mr. Dixon's choice. There were three others, Jane says, which they hesitated about some time. Colonel Campbell rather preferred an olive. My dear Jane, are you sure you did not wet your feet? It was but a drop or two, but I am so afraid. But Mr. Frank Churchill was so extremely... Oh, and there was a mat to step on. I shall never get, forget the extreme kindness. Oh, Mr. Frank Churchill, I must tell you, my mother's spectacles have never been in fault since. The rivet never came out again. My mother often talks of your good nature. Does not she, Jane? 
Do we often not talk of Mr. Frank Churchill? Oh, here's Miss Woodhouse. Oh, dear Miss Woodhouse, how do you do? Very well, I thank you, quite well. This is a meeting quite in fairyland. Such a transformation must not compliment, I know, she said as she eyed Emma most complacently. That would be rude. But upon my word, Miss Woodhouse, you do look... How do you like Jane's hair? You're a judge. She did it all herself. Quite wonderful how she does her hair. No hairdresser from London, I think, could. Oh, Dr. Hughes, I declare. And Mrs. Hughes. Must go and speak to Dr. and Mrs. Hughes for a moment. How do you do? How do you do? Very well, I thank you. This is delightful, is it not? Oh, where's dear Mr. Richard? Oh! Oh, there he is. Oh, don't disturb him. Much better employ talking to the young ladies. How do you do, Mr. Richard? Oh, I saw you the other day as you rode through the town. Mrs. Otway, I protest. And good Mr. Otway and Miss Otway and Miss Caroline, such a host of friends. And Mr. George and Mr. Arthur. Oh, how do you do? How do you all do? Oh, quite well. I'm much obliged to you. Never better. Don't I hear another carriage? Who can this be? Very likely the worthy Coles. Oh, upon my word, this is charming to be standing about among such friends, and such a noble fire. I'm quite roasted. Oh, no coffee, thank you for me. Never take coffee. Oh, a little tea, if you please, sir. By and by, no hurry. Oh, here it comes. Everything's so good. Mr. Frank Churchill returned to his station by Emma, as soon as Miss Bates was quiet. She found herself necessarily overhearing the discourse of Mrs. Elton and Miss Fairfax, who were standing a little way behind her. He was thoughtful. Whether he was overhearing too, she could not determine. After a good many compliments to Jane on her dress and look, compliments very quietly and properly taken, Mrs. Elton was evidently wanting to be complimented herself, and it was, How do you like my gown? How do you like my trimming? How has Wright done my hair? With many other relative questions, all answered with patient politeness. Mrs. Elton then said, Nobody can think less of dress in general than I do, but upon such an occasion as this, when everybody's eyes are so much upon me, and in compliment to the Westons, who I have no doubt are giving this ball chiefly to do me honour, I would not wish to be inferior to others, and I see very few pearls in the room except for mine. Oh, so Frank Churchill is a capital dancer, I understand. We shall see if our styles suit. A fine young man, certainly, is Frank Churchill. I like him very well. At this moment, Frank began talking so vigorously that Emma could but not but imagine he had overheard his own praises and did not want to hear more. And the voices of the ladies were drowned for a while, till another suspension brought Mrs. Elton's tones again distinctly forward. Mr. Elton had just joined them, and his wife was exclaiming, "'Oh, you have found us out at last, have you, in our seclusion? I was this moment telling Jane I thought you would begin to be impatient for tidings of us.' "'Jane,' repeated Frank Churchill, with a look of surprise and displeasure, "'that is easy. But Miss Fairfax does not disapprove it, I suppose.' "'How do you like Mrs. Elton?' said Emma in a whisper. "'Not at all. You are ungrateful. Ungrateful? What do you mean?' Then changing from a frown to a smile, "'No, do not tell me. I do not want to know what you mean. Oh, where is my father? When are we to begin dancing?' Emma could hardly understand him. He seemed in an odd humour. He walked off to find his father, but was quickly back again, with both Mr. and Mrs. Weston. He had met with them in a little perplexity, which must be laid before Emma. 
It had just occurred to Mrs. Weston that Mrs. Elton must be asked to begin the ball, but she would expect it, which interfered with all their wishes of giving Emma that distinction. Emma heard the sad truth with fortitude. "'And what are we to do for a proper partner for her?' said Mr. Weston. "'She will think Frank ought to ask her.' Frank turned instantly to Emma to claim her former promise, and boasted himself an engaged man, which his father looked his most perfect approbation of. And it then appeared that Mrs. Weston was wanting him to dance with Mrs. Elton himself, and that their business was to help to persuade him into it, which was done pretty soon. Mr. Weston and Mrs. Elton led the way, Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Woodhouse followed. Emma must submit to stand second to Mrs. Elton, though she had always considered the ball as particularly for her. It was almost enough to make her think of marrying. Mrs. Elton had undoubtedly the advantage at this time in vanity completely gratified. For though she had intended to begin with Frank Churchill, she could not lose by the change. Mr. Weston might be his son's superior. In spite of this little rub, however, Emma was smiling with enjoyment, delighted to see the respectable length of the set as it was forming, and to feel that she had so many hours of unusual festivity before her. She was more disturbed by Mr. Knightley's not dancing than by anything else. There he was, among the standers-by where he ought not to be. He ought to be dancing, not classing himself with the husbands and fathers and whist players who were pretending to feel an interest in the dance till their rubbers were made up, so young as he looked. He could not have appeared to greater advantage perhaps anywhere than where he had placed himself. His tall, firm, upright figure, among the bulky forms and stooping shoulders of the elderly men, was such as Emma felt must draw everybody's eyes. And, excepting her own partner, there was not one among the whole row of young men who could be compared with him. He moved a few steps nearer, and those few steps were enough to prove in how gentlemanlike a manner, with what natural grace he must have danced, would he but take the trouble. Whenever she caught his eye, she forced him to smile, but in general he was looking grave, she wished he could love a ballroom better, and could like Frank Churchill better. He seemed often observing her. She must not flatter herself that he thought of her dancing. But if he were criticising her behaviour, she did not feel afraid. There was nothing like flirtation between her and her partner. They seemed more like cheerful, easy friends than lovers that Frank Churchill thought less of her than he had done, was indubitable. The ball proceeded pleasantly. The anxious cares, the incessant attentions of Mrs. Weston, were not thrown away. Everybody seemed happy, and the praise of being a delightful ball, which is seldom bestowed till after a ball has ceased to be, was repeatedly given in the very beginning of the existence of this, of very important, very recordable events, it was not more productive than such meetings usually are. There was one, however, which Emma thought something of. The last two dances, before supper were begun, and Harriet had no partner, the only young lady sitting down, and so equal had been hitherto the number of dancers that how could there be any one disengaged was the wonder. 
But Emma's wonder lessened soon afterwards on seeing Mr. Elton sauntering about. He would not ask Harriet to, to dance if it were possible to be avoided. She was sure he would not, and she was expecting him every moment to escape into the card room. Escape, however, was not his plan. He came to the part of the room where the sitters-by were collected, spoke to some, and walked about in front of them, as if to show his liberty, and his resolution of maintaining it. He did not omit being sometimes directly before Miss Smith, or speaking to those who were close to her. Emma saw it. She was not yet dancing. She was working her way up from the bottom, and had therefore leisure to look around. And by only turning her head a little, she saw it all. When she was halfway up the set, the whole group were exactly behind her, and she would no longer allow her eyes to watch. But Mr. Elton was so near that she heard every syllable of dialogue which just then took place between him and Mrs. Weston, and she perceived that his wife, who was standing immediately above her, was not only listening also, but even encouraging him by significant glances. The kind-hearted, gentle Mrs. Weston had left her seat to join him and say, Do not you dance, Mr. Elton? To which his prompt reply was, Most readily, Mrs. Weston, if you will dance with me. Me? Oh, no, I would get you a better partner than myself. I am no dancer. If Mrs. Gilbert wishes to dance, said he, I shall have great pleasure, I am sure, for, though beginning to feel myself rather an old married man, and that my dancing days are over, it would give me very great pleasure at any time to stand up with an old friend like Mrs. Gilbert. Mrs. Gilbert does not mean to dance, but there is a young lady disengaged whom I should be very glad to see dancing, Miss Smith. Miss Smith? Oh, I had not observed. You're extremely obliging, and if I were not an old married man, oh, but my dancing days are over, Mrs. Weston, you'll excuse me. Anything else I should be most happy to do at your command, but uh, uh, my dancing days are over. Mrs. Weston said no more, and Emma could imagine with what surprise and mortification she must be returning to her seat. This was Mr. Elton, the amiable, obliging, gentle Mr. Elton. She looked round for a moment. He had joined Mr. Knightley at a little distance, and was arranging himself for settled conversation, while smiles of high glee passed between him and his wife. She would not look again. Her heart was in a glow, and she feared her face might be as hot. In another moment a happier sight caught her, Mr. Knightley leading Harriet to the set. Never had she been more surprised, seldom more delighted, than at that instant. She was all pleasure and gratitude, both for Harriet and herself, and longed to be thanking him. And though too distant for speech, her countenance said as much as soon as she could catch his eye again. His dancing proved to be just what she had believed it, extremely good, and Harriet would have seemed almost too lucky if it had not been for the cruel state of things before, and for the very complete enjoyment and very high sense of the distinction which her happy features announced. It was not thrown away on her. She bounded higher than ever, flew farther down the middle, and was in a continual course of smiles. Mr. Elton had retreated into the card room, looking, Emma trusted, very foolish. She did not think he was quite so hardened as his wife, though growing very like her. 
She spoke some of her feelings by observing audibly to her partner, Knightley has taken pity on poor little Miss Smith. Very good-natured, I declare. Supper was announced. The move began, and Miss Bates might be heard from that moment, without interruption, till her being seated at table and taking up her spoon. Jane, Jane, my dear Jane, where are you? Here is your tippet. Mrs. Weston begs you to put on your tippet. She says she is afraid there will be draughts in the passage, though everything has been done. One door nailed up, quantities of matting, my dear Jane. Indeed you must. Oh, Mr. Churchill, oh, oh, you're too obliging. How well you put it on, so gratified. Excellent dancing indeed, yes, my dear. I ran home, as I said I should, to help Grandmamma to bed, and got back again, and nobody missed me. I set off without saying a word, just as I told you. Grandmamma was quite well, had a charming evening with Mr. Woodhouse, a vast deal of chat and backgammon. Tea was made downstairs, biscuits and baked apples and wine before she came away. Amazing luck in some of her throws, and she inquired a great deal about you, how you were amused, and who were your partners. Oh, I said, I shall not forestall Jane. I left her dancing with Mr. George Otway. She will love to tell you all about it herself tomorrow. Her first partner was Mr. Elton. I do not know who will ask her next. Perhaps Mr. William Cox. My dear sir, you are too obliging. Is there nobody you would not rather? I am not helpless. Oh, sir, you are most kind. Upon my word, Jane on one arm and me on the other. Stop, stop, let us stand back a little. Mrs. Elton is going. Oh, dear Mrs. Elton, how elegant she looks. Beautiful lace. Now we all follow in her train, quite the queen of the evening. Well, here we are at the passage. Two steps, Jane. Take care of the two steps. Oh, no, there is but one. Well, I was persuaded there were two, and there is but one. How very odd. I was convinced there were two. I never saw anything equal to the comfort and style candles everywhere. I was telling you of your grandmamma, Jane. There was a little disappointment. The baked apples and biscuits, excellent in their way, you know, but there was a delicate fricassee of sweetbread and some asparagus brought in at first, and good Mr. Woodhouse, not thinking the asparagus quite boiled enough, sent it all out again. Now there is nothing grandmamma loves better than sweetbread and asparagus, so she was rather disappointed, but we agreed we would not speak of it to anybody for fear of its getting round to dear Miss Woodhouse, who would be so very much concerned. Oh, well, this is brilliant. I am all amazement. Could not have proposed anything. Oh, such elegance and profusion. I have seen nothing like it since. Well, where shall we sit? Where shall we sit? anywhere, so that Jane is not in a draught. Where I sit is of no consequence. Oh, do you recommend this side? Oh, well, I'm sure, Mr. Churchill, it only seems too good, oh, but just as you please. What you direct in this house cannot be wrong. Dear Jane, how shall we ever recollect half the dishes for Grandmamma? Oh, soup, too? Oh, bless me, I should not be helped so soon, but it smells most excellent, and I cannot help beginning. Emma had no opportunity of speaking to Mr. Knightley till after supper, but when they were all in the ballroom again, her eyes invited him irresistibly to come to her and be thanked. He was warm in his reprobation of Mr. Elton's conduct. It had been an unpardonable rudeness, and Mrs. Elton's looks also received the due share of censure. They aimed at wounding more than Harriet, said he. Emma, why is it that you are enemies? He looked with smiling penetration, and on receiving no answer, added, She ought not to be angry with you, I suspect, whatever he may be. To that surmise you say nothing, of course, but confess, Emma, that you did want him to marry Harriet. I did, replied Emma, and they cannot forgive me. He shook his head, but there was a smile of indulgence with it, and he only said, I shall not scold you. I leave you to your own reflections. Can you trust me with such flatterers? 
Does my vain spirit ever tell me I am wrong? Not your vain spirit, but your serious spirit. If one leads you wrong, I am sure the other tells you of it. I do own myself to have been completely mistaken in Mr. Elton. There is a littleness about him which you discovered, and which I did not. I was fully convinced of his being in love with Harriet. It was through a series of strange blunders. And in return for your acknowledging so much, I will do you the justice to say that you would have chosen for him better than he has chosen for himself. Harriet Smith has some first-rate qualities, which Mrs. Elton is totally without. An unpretending, single-minded, artless girl, infinitely to be preferred by any man of sense and taste to such a woman as Mrs. Elton. I found Harriet more conversable than I expected. Emma was extremely gratified. They were interrupted by the bustle of Mr. Weston, calling on everybody to begin dancing again. Come, Miss Woodhouse, Miss Otway, Miss Fairfax. What are you all doing? Come, Emma, set your companions the example. Everybody is lazy. Everybody's asleep. I am ready, said Emma, whenever I am wanted. Whom are you going to dance with? asked Mr. Knightley. She hesitated a moment, and then replied, With you, if you will ask me. Will you? he said, offering his hand. Indeed, I will. You have shown that you can dance, and you know we are not really so much brother and sister as to make it at all improper. Brother and sister? No. Indeed. Chapter 39 This little explanation with Mr. Knightley gave Emma considerable pleasure. It was one of the agreeable recollections of the ball, which she walked about the lawn the next morning to enjoy. She was extremely glad that they had come to so good an understanding respecting the Eltons, that their opinions of both husband and wife were so much alike, and his praise of Harriet, his concession in her favour, was particularly gratifying. The impertinence of the Eltons, which for a few minutes had threatened to ruin the rest of her evening, had been the occasion of some of its highest satisfactions, and she looked forward to another happier result. The cure of Harriet's infatuation. From Harriet's manner of speaking of the circumstance before they quitted the ballroom, she had strong hopes. It seemed as if her eyes were suddenly opened, and she were enabled to see that Mr. Elton was not the superior creature she had believed him. The fever was over, and Emma could harbour little fear of the pulse being quickened again by injurious courtesy. She depended on the evil feelings of the Eltons for supplying all the discipline of pointed neglect that could be further requisite. Harriet rational, Frank Churchill not too much in love, and Mr. Knightley not wanting to quarrel with her. How very happy a summer must be before her. She was not to see Frank Churchill this morning. He had told her that he would not allow himself the pleasure of stopping at Hartfield, as he was to be at home by the middle of the day. She did not regret it. Having arranged all these matters, looked at them through, and put them all to rights, she was just turning to the house with spirits refreshed for the demands of the two little boys, as well as of their grandpapa, when the great iron sweep-gate opened, and two persons entered, who she had never less expected to see together, Frank Churchill, with Harriet leaning on his arm, actually Harriet. A moment sufficed to convince her that something extraordinary had happened. Harriet looked white and frightened, and he was trying to cheer her. The iron gates and the front door were not twenty yards asunder. 
They were all three soon in the hall, and Harriet, immediately sinking into a chair, fainted away. A young lady who faints must be recovered. Questions must be answered, and surprises be explained. Such events are very interesting, but the suspense of them cannot last long. A few minutes made Emma acquainted with the whole. Miss Smith and Miss Bickerton, another parlour boarder at Mrs. Goddard's, who had been also at the ball, had walked out together, taken a road, the Richmond Road, which, though apparently public enough for safety, had led them into alarm. About half a mile beyond Highbury, making a sudden turn, and deeply shaded by elms on each side, it became, for a considerable stretch, very retired, and when the young ladies had advanced some way into it, they had suddenly perceived, at a small distance before them, on a broader patch of greensward by the side, a party of gypsies. A child on the watch came towards them to beg, and Miss Bickerton, excessively frightened, gave a great scream, and calling on Harriet to follow her, ran up a steep bank, cleared a slight hedge at the top, and made the best of her way, by a shortcut back to Highbury. But poor Harriet could not follow. She had suffered very much from cramp after dancing, and her first attempt to mount the bank brought on such a return of it as made her absolutely powerless. And in this state, and exceedingly terrified, she had been obliged to remain. How the trampers might have behaved, had the young ladies been more courageous, must be doubtful. But such an invitation for attack could not be resisted, and Harriet was soon assailed by half a dozen children, headed by a stout woman and a great boy, all clamorous and impertinent in look, though not absolutely in word. More and more frightened, she immediately promised them money, and taking out her purse gave them a shilling, and begged them not to want more, or use her ill. She was then able to walk, though but slowly, and was moving away, but the terror, her terror, and her purse were too tempting, and she was followed, or rather surrounded, by the whole gang, demanding more. In this state Frank Churchill had found her, she trembling and conditioning, they loud and insolent. By a most fortunate chance, his leaving Highbury had been delayed, so as to bring him to her assistance at this critical moment. The pleasantness of the morning had induced him to walk forward, and leave his horses to meet him by another road, a mile or two beyond Highbury. And happening to have borrowed a pair of scissors the night before of Mrs. Bates, and to have forgotten to restore them, he had been obliged to stop at her door, and go in for a few minutes. He was therefore later than he had intended, and being on foot, was unseen by the whole party till almost close to them. The terror which the woman and the boy had been creating in Harriet was then their own portion. He had left them completely frightened, and Harriet, eagerly clinging to him and hardly able to speak, had just strength enough to reach Hartfield before her spirits were quite overcome. It was his idea to bring her to Hartfield. He had thought of no other place. This was the amount of the whole story of his communication, and of Harriet's, as soon as she had recovered her senses and speech. He dared not stay longer than to see her well. These several delays left him not another minute to lose, and Emma engaging to give assurance of her safety to Mrs. Goddard, and notice of there being such a set of people in the neighbourhood to Mr. Knightley, he set off, with all the grateful blessings that she could utter for her friend and herself. Such an adventure as this, a fine young man and a lovely young woman thrown together in such a way, could hardly fail of suggesting certain ideas to the coldest heart and the steadiest brain. So Emma thought, at least. Could a linguist, could a grammarian, could even a mathematician have seen what she did, have witnessed their appearance together, and heard their history of it, 
without feeling that circumstances had been at work to make them peculiarly interesting to one another. How much more must be must an imaginist, like herself, be on fire with speculation and foresight, especially with such a groundwork of anticipation as her mind had already made? It was a very extraordinary thing. Nothing of the sort had ever occurred before to any young ladies in the place within her memory. No raconteur, no alarm of the kind, and now it had happened to the very person, and at the very hour, when the other very person was chancing to pass by to rescue her. It certainly was very extraordinary. And knowing, as she did, the favourable state of mind of each at this period, it struck her the more. He was wishing to get the better of his attachment to herself, she just recovering from her mania for Mr. Elton. It seemed as if everything united to promise the most interesting consequences. It was not possible that the occurrence should not be strongly recommending each to the other. In the few minutes' conversation which she had yet had with him, while Harriet had been partially insensible, he had spoken of her terror, her naivete, her fervour as she seized and clung to his arm with a sensibility amused and delighted. And just at last, after Harriet's own account had been given, he had expressed his indignation at the abominable folly of Mrs. Bickerton in the warmest terms. Everything was to take its natural course, however, neither impelled nor assisted. She would not stir a step, nor drop a hint. No, she had had enough of interference. There could be no harm in a scheme, a merely passive scheme. It was no more than a wish. Beyond it, she would on no account proceed. Emma's first resolution was to keep her father from the knowledge of what had passed, aware of the anxiety and alarm it would occasion, but she soon felt that concealment must be impossible. Within half an hour it was known all over Highbury. It was the very event to engage those who talk most, the young and the low, and all the youth and servants in the place were soon in the happiness of frightful news. The last night's ball seemed lost in the gypsies. Poor Mr. Woodhouse trembled as he sat, as Emma had foreseen, would scarcely be satisfied without their promising never to go beyond the shrubbery again. It was some comfort to him that many inquiries after himself and Miss Woodhouse, for his neighbours knew that he loved to be inquired after, as well as Miss Smith, were coming in during the rest of the day, and he had the very pleasure of returning for answer that they were all very indifferent, which though not exactly true. For she was perfectly well, and Harriet not much otherwise, Emma would not interfere with. She had an unhappy state of health in general for the child of such a man, for she hardly knew what indisposition was, and if he did not invent illnesses for her, she could make no figure in a message. The gypsies did not wait for the operations of justice, they took themselves off in a hurry. The young ladies of Highbury might have walked again in safety before their panic began, and the whole history dwindled soon into a matter of little importance but to Emma and her nephews. In her imagination it maintained its ground, and Henry and John were still asking every day for the story of Harriet and the gypsies and still tenaciously setting her right if she varied in the slightest particular from the original recital. Chapter 40 A very few days had passed after this adventure, when Harriet came one morning to Emma with a small parcel in her hand, and after sitting down and hesitating, thus began, Miss Woodhouse, if you are at leisure... I have something that I should like to tell you, a sort of um, confession to make, 
and then, you know, it will be over. Emma was a good deal surprised, but begged her to speak. There was a seriousness in Harriet's manner which prepared her, quite as much as her words, for something more than ordinary. It is my duty, and I am sure it is my wish, she continued, to have no reserves with you on this subject, as I am quite happily an altered creature in one respect, it is very fit that you should have the satisfaction of knowing it. I do not want to say more than is necessary. I am too much ashamed of having given way as I have done, and I dare say you understand me. Yes, said Emma. I hope I do. How I could so long a time be fancying myself, cried Harriet warmly. It seems like madness. I can see nothing at all extraordinary in him now. I do not care whether I meet him or not, except that of the two I had rather not see him. And indeed I would rather go any distance round to avoid him. But I do not envy his wife in the least. I neither admire her nor envy her, as I have done. She is very charming, I dare say, and all that, but I think her very ill-tempered and disagreeable. I shall never forget her look the other night. However, I assure you, Miss Woodhouse, I wish her no evil. No, let them be ever so happy together. It will not give me another moment's pang. And to convince you that I have been speaking truth, I am now going to destroy what I ought to have destroyed long ago, what I ought never to have kept. I know that very well. She blushed as she spoke. However, now I will destroy it all, and it is my particular wish to do it in your presence, that you may see how rational I am grown. Cannot you guess what this parcel holds? said she, with a conscious look. Not the least in the world. Did he ever give you anything? No. I cannot call them gifts, but they are things that I have valued very much. She held the parcel towards her, and Emma read the words, Most Precious Treasures, on the top. Her curiosity was greatly excited. Harriet unfolded the parcel, and she looked on with impatience. Within abundance of silver paper was a pretty little Tunbridgeware box, which Harriet opened. It was well lined with the softest cotton, but excepting the cotton, Emma saw only a small piece of court plaster. Now, said Harriet, you must recollect. No, indeed I do not. Oh, dear me, I should not have thought it possible you could forget what passed in this very room about court plaster one of the very last times we ever met in it. It was but a very few days before I had my sore throat, just before Mr. and Mrs. John Knightley came. I think it was the very evening. Do not you remember his cutting his finger with your new penknife, and your recommending court plaster? But as you had none about you, and I knew I had, you desired me to supply him and so I took mine out and cut him a piece, but it was a great deal too large, and he cut it smaller, and kept playing some time with what he was had left, before he gave it back to me. And so then, in my nonsense, I could not help making a treasure of it, so I put it by, never to be used, and looked at it now and then as a great treat. My dearest Harriet, cried Emma, putting her hand before her face and jumping up, you make me more ashamed of myself than I can bear. Remember it, I, I remember it all now, except your saving this relic. I presume that's relic, but it's spelled R-E-L-I-C-K. I knew nothing of that till this moment, 
but the cutting the finger and my recommending cold plaster, and saying I had none about me. Oh, my sins, my sins, and I had plenty all the while in my pocket. One of my senseless tricks, I deserve to be under a continual blush all the rest of my life. Well, she said, sitting down, go on, what else? And, and you really had some at hand yourself? I'm sure I never suspected it, and you did it so naturally. And you so actually put this piece of court plaster by for his sake, said Emma, recovering from her state of shame and feeling divided between wonder and amusement. And secretly she said to herself, Lord bless me, when should I have thought of putting by in cotton a piece of court plaster that Frank Churchill had been pulling about? I never was equal to this. Here, resumed Harriet, turning to her box again, here is something still more valuable. I mean, that has been more valuable, because this is what really did once belong to him, which the court plaster never did. Emma was quite eager to see this superior treasure. It was the end of an old pencil, the part without any lead. This was really his, said Harriet. Do not you remember one morning? No, I dare say you do not. But one morning, I forget exactly the day, but perhaps it was the Tuesday or Wednesday before that evening, he wanted to make a memorandum in his pocket book. It was about spruce beer. Mr. Knightley had been telling him something about brewing spruce beer, and he wanted to put it down. But when he took out his pencil, there was so little lead that he soon cut it all the way, and it would not do. So you lent him another, and this was left upon the table as good for nothing. But I kept my eye on it, and as soon as I dared, caught it up, and never parted with it again from that moment. I do remember it! cried Emma. I perfectly remember it talking about spruce beer. Oh, yes. Mr. Knightley and I both saying we liked it, and Mr. Elton seeming resolved to learn to like it, too. I perfectly remember it. Stop. Mr. Knightley was standing just there. Was he not? I have an idea. He was standing just there. Ah, I do not know. I cannot recollect. It's very odd, but I cannot recollect. Mr. Elton was sitting here, I remember, much about where I am now. Well, go on. Oh, that's all. I have nothing more to show you or to say, except that I am now going to throw them both behind the fire and wish you to see me do it. <laughs> My poor dear Harriet. Have you actually found happiness in treasuring up these things? Yes, simpleton as I was, but I'm quite ashamed of it now, and wish I could forget as easily as I can burn them. It was very wrong of me, you know, to keep any remembrances after he was married. I knew it was, but had not resolution enough to part with them. But Harriet... Is it necessary to burn the court plaster? I have not a word to say for the little bit of old pencil, but the court plaster might be useful. I shall be happier to burn it, replied Harriet. It has a disagreeable look to me. I must get rid of everything. There it goes, and there is an end, thank heaven, of Mr. Elton. And when? thought Emma, will there be a beginning of Mr. Churchill? She had, soon afterwards, reason to believe that the beginning was already made, and could not but hope that the gypsy, though she had told no fortune, must be proved to have made Harriet's. About a fortnight after the alarm, they came to a sufficient explanation and quite undesignedly. Emma was not thinking of it at the moment, which made the information she received more valuable. She merely said, 
in the course of some trivial chat. Well, Harriet, whenever you marry, I would advise you to do so and so, and thought no more of it, till after a minute's silence she heard Harriet say in a very serious tone, I shall never marry. Emma, then, looked up and immediately saw how it was, and after a moment's debate as to whether it should pass unnoticed or not, replied, Never marry. This is a new resolution. It is one that I shall never change, however. After another short hesitation, I hope it does not proceed from... I hope... I hope it is not in compliment to Mr. Elton. Mr. Elton, indeed, cried Harriet indignantly. Oh, no. And Emma could just catch the words, so superior to Mr. Elton. She then took a longer time for consideration. Should she proceed no further? Should she let it pass and seem to suspect nothing? Perhaps Harriet might think her cold or angry if she did, or perhaps if she were totally silent, it might only drive Harriet into asking her to hear too much, and against anything like such an unreserve as had been, such an open and frequent discussion of hopes and chances, she was perfectly resolved. She believed it would be wiser for her to say and know at once, and that she meant to say and know. Plain dealing was always best. She had previously determined how far she would proceed on any application of the sort, and it would be safer for both to have the judicious law of her own brain laid down with speed. She was decided, and thus spoke. Harriet, I will not affect to be in doubt of your meaning. Your resolution, or rather your expectation, of never marrying, results from an idea that the person whom you might prefer would be too greatly or superior in situation to think of you. Is it not so? Oh, Miss Woodhouse, believe me, I have not the presumption to suppose. Indeed, I am not so mad. But it is a pleasure to me to admire him at a distance. And to think of his infinite superiority to all the rest of the world, with the gratitude, wonder, and veneration which are so proper, in me especially. I am not at all surprised at you, Harriet. The service he rendered you was enough to warm your heart. Service? Oh, it was such an inexpressible obligation. The very recollection of it and all that I felt at the time when I saw him coming, his noble look and my wretchedness before. Such a change, in one moment, such a change, from perfect misery to perfect happiness. It is very natural. It's natural, and it's honourable. Yes, honourable, I think, to choose so well and so gratefully. But that it will be a fortunate preference is more than I can promise. I do not advise you to give way to it, Harriet. I do not by any means engage for its being returned. Consider what you are about. Perhaps it will be wisest in you to check your feelings while you can. At any rate, do not let them carry you far unless you are persuaded of his liking you. Be observant of him. Let his behaviour be the guide of your sensations. I give you this caution now, because I shall never speak to you on the subject of it again. I am determined against all interference. Henceforth I shall know nothing of the matter. Let no name ever pass our lips. We were very wrong before. We will be cautious now. He is your superior, no doubt, and there do seem objections and obstacles of a very serious nature, but yet... Harriet. More wonderful things have taken place. There have been matches of greater disparity. But take care of yourself. I would not have you too sanguine, though, 
however it may end. Be assured that your raising your thoughts to him is a mark of good taste, which I shall always know how to value. Harriet kissed her hand in silent and submissive gratitude. Emma was very decided in thinking such an attachment no bad thing for her friend. Its tendency would be to raise and refine her mind, and it must be saving her from the danger of degradation. And on that moment we will end for today, dear friends. <sighs> Another time in which I fear that Emma has gotten the wrong end of the stick. I have my suspicions that who Harriet is talking about is not who Emma has in mind for her. But we will see next time on Soft Stories. But before we go, I did want to say something quickly. The reading that we did today uses a specific word, uh, gypsy, which is a reference to uh, peoples of nomadic origin, uh, and that word is considered to be a slur now. Uh, it and its associated words, like to be cheated out of something is to be gypped, they are offensive and should not be used in conversation. My understanding, though, if any members of the community wish to reach out to me, I would be delighted to learn more. My understanding is that the correct way to refer to a group of people of this particular cultural group is to refer to them as uh, Roma or Romani. Uh, and to not use such words associated with the term gypsy, as it is a cruel and um, offensive bit of slang. I used it in this book to simply maintain the flow of the reading uh, and to be true to the original source, but I do not condone its use, and I suggest that if it is part of your vocabulary that you take some time to educate yourself uh, and remove it from there. Though it may mean nothing to you, it does mean something quite strong to other people. Thank you for allowing me to go on that little tangent and for joining me today on Soft Stories. If you wish to leave a comment for a question to be answered on the question and answer episode later this year or at the start of next year, I would be heartily uh, gratified by your doing so, and I look forward to seeing them. I look forward, too, to the challenge itself. We've already got a collection of hot sauces growing in our kitchen, sitting there menacingly on the counter, just waiting. Waiting. At any rate, thank you again for joining me this time on Soft Stories, when next we meet, we will find out what happens in the life of Emma, that noble woman who seems to always have the wrong end of the stick. Until such time that we meet again, I wish you all the best, and goodbye. <laughs>